Wednesday night, getting to talk a little bit more and uh, just kind of chill, not not so, not as crazy as like a Sunday. Um, so it, it it is good to to be here. We got a couple things that I would like for us to um, to pray about tonight. Um, so all of you that um, all of you that all of you that knew Amberly in that whole uh, in this whole deal as far as like you've seen her over the last several years and you know over the last couple of years and been in and, and all, all this and that just a little uh, kind of like what what happened today today went really well uh, as far as the funeral goes I think um, I don't know I think there were several that uh, that said they called on the Lord and asked him to save them and um, there was probably I don't know somewhere between I mean, just so many hands. There was probably somewhere between 50 to 15 to 30 that actually went up during the service, like that said they were lost and needed to be saved. So there was a great reception as far as uh, the gospel being preached, and so I think that I think that the Lord was honored by all that big time. But I say all that to say this: I want us to pray for them tonight. Um, one. Um, Let's let's pray so we were able to take food over there um, after after the funeral while they were do while we was at the graveside. Uh, Candace and I think Nicole went and took the food and all that and and got that over there. And thank you to all of you that gave towards that. Um, but uh, outside of that, you know. We're going to have an opportunity to minister to that family, and not just that family. But I've had I had I had a dozen people come up to me and ask me where our church was, and like, you know, kind of who I was and all this stuff. And and it, it really does make a difference how we receive those people when they come. And so I just want you to start praying about that. I don't know who will show up when, if anybody will show up. Um, but they did hear the gospel, and they, they man, they heard it as, as plain as I know how to say it. And, um, and I, I think that God was, was pleased with it today. But I want us to pray about that. They're, they're having a little get-together over at their house tonight. And the last thing I want is for everything that God did today, you know, for it to kind of be null and void by the guilt of sin that they might commit tonight, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot involved there, if you know what I'm saying. Um, like when you've lived in the course of this world, is for we'll just say 40 years. Uh, it's about the age, common age of all of them. When you've lived in the course of the world for for 40 years, it is it is particularly difficult to come out of that just like that. Like it's not as it's not it's not super easy, especially when we're so connected as we are right now with social media and so connected with our cell phones and everything else. So, I want us to pray for them tonight. I want us to ask God earnestly, ask the Lord, God, give us a platform to witness to these people for one, to see them saved. And not just see them say, but to see them get in discipleship, to see them want to grow in the Lord. And that's something that, that is essential in this whole thing. I think we could, I think, you know, my own opinion about the whole thing, there could have been a lot avoided in this whole deal if there would have been a real real commitment to discipleship in this thing. Um, maybe it would have happened just like it did. I, I don't necessarily think it would, but but maybe it would have. Who knows? Uh, but I but I do want us to pray about that, and I want us to ask God to to really help us. Um, maybe you're maybe you're a person that gets up every single morning, and you wake up with the intentions, Lord, man, I'm ready to go minister to somebody today. Is it anybody? I mean, you just you just roll out of the bed. Anybody in here? Do they just? Do you just do that automatically, or do you have to really make sure your flesh is dead before you start doing that? I mean, I, I, maybe maybe you're way different than I am, but it's it's 
if you if you don't get up with the intended purpose that I'm going to minister to somebody today, then nine times out of ten, you go through life, you go through that day living for yourself. And so I want, I want us to make sure that we as a church, you say, well, this is a church, we're going to minister to people. Well, look, it, believe it or not, you, the reception, how people feel in terms of you when they come in here, nine times out of ten is going to dictate whether they really are going to come back to this place or not. If they feel like that we, you know, that we're, we're against them, chances are they're not coming back. And so I want us to make sure that we we pray about that tonight. And um, you pray for their family, pray for those two girls. Uh, one of the girls is, is my girl's age, and uh, I think Lexi's, is she seven, six or seven years old? And um, so j- just pray for her, it, 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 pray for them, it, that was a, that was a hard pill to swallow, watching that little girl trying to process her mama there and, and, um, and that whole deal in her little mind, not being able to figure all that out was a real stressor for me. And uh, so I, I just want, I want to do that. I want to pray for them tonight. And, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into what we're going to do as far as our study goes tonight. And then we'll, we got a couple more things I want to finish on, I want to pray on at the end. But um, before we do, uh, Brian, w- w- would you pray for us, man? James chapter number 4, James chapter number 4, James 4, we'll start in verse uh, 13, we'll go down to verse 17. All right, verse 13, go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. This last week, I have spent the majority of um, Sunday, Sunday after church, we at uh, 4.30, 
we married Chandler and Cheyenne off, and um, and they asked me to to preach and give the gospel at this at this wedding, and um, and hey, I'm I'm all for that. I, it was actually the first time that that's ever happened for me, and uh, but but I did, and I, I hey, praise the Lord. I there's another group of people that got to hear the gospel, but this was one of this is one of the places that I started out. And then all over again, come full circle back on Wednesday, and I'm going to a funeral, and, and same deal. I'm, I'm fixing to preach a funeral of a lady that is, that is 40 years old. And the same thought keeps popping in my mind. Man, life is short. Life is extremely, extremely short. Is, is I study this whole thing out in James, and, and I understand when we use the one verse, verse number 14, we understand that, that life is a vapor. It, it, man, it's like a, it, it's, it's literally, it's here, and then it's gone. I, I mean, if you, if you were honest, the 168 hours, the last week that you had, probably seem like 20 hours I, I mean if you're if you're honest I mean there it, it seems and it seems like the the longer that we live it, it's almost like the the faster that time seems to move like the older I get it seems like I'm losing time like I'm always trying to gain time somewhere why because life is a vapor it appeareth for a little time and then it vanisheth away but as, as I, so I'm kind of combing through some of this stuff and, and, looking at, and, and looking at this. And I get down to verse number 17. And for a long time, for most of my Christian life, I have heard verse 17. To him that knoweth to do good and do it, doeth it not, to him it's sin. So I've, I've, I've heard this verse in, in it taken by itself, and there's nothing wrong with taking it by itself, but I've always heard it. Hey, if you know to do right and you don't do it, it's sin. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. I, and I get that. That is a true statement. But in the context of these verses, I, I, I think the severity behind verse 17 needs to be emphasized. I think it needs to be emphasized, but because remember, what, what do we say? If, when we see that word, therefore, we always go back and what? Yeah, we see why it's therefore, right? And so I get down to verse 17, and therefore, there, and, and uh, you know, it's just a rule of Bible study. It pops in your mind, and you think about it, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it's sin. Well, just how big of an admonition is, is James letting loose on us in terms of what we, what we say as far as our plans for the future? You know, it's crazy how, I mean, how, how we are, especially Americans. Americans are obsessed with the future. We're obsessed with everything that has to do with the future. You know, you know how I know that, especially Christians? You, you, you put out... On a church sign, we're, we're uh, prophecy month. We're going to study the end times. Send out an email, a mass email to that whole church. Hey, look, we're come learn what the future holds. Come and learn what's going to happen in the future. You, that, that we're going to tell you about end times events. D did you know that the biggest church services that I can remember? At the very first church I ever got to say, the biggest church services I ever remember was those church services to where they spent Sunday nights going through a prophecy series. I'm talking about would pack the whole church out. Like more people came on that Sunday night, on those Sunday nights, than they did on those Sunday mornings. Well, well, there should, you know, everybody wants to know about end times. Everybody, But here, here's the thing. I think if we're not careful... We get so consumed with the futuristic things and the end times things 
that we forget that there's actually 24 hours in a day, 168 hours in a week, that we got to live in this present world. Well, we get so caught up in the, in, in, in like, you know, uh, and, and look, I love, I love hearing the, the, the ideas about futuristic stuff, and I, I, lo- I love it, but at the same time, I just wonder, is it a deterrent that would keep us, if life is so short, what should be, what should be the two things that we do more than anything? I mean, and I wrote these, what should be the two things I do? One, I should love God. Two, I should love people. If my life really is a vapor, and it, it appears for a little, a little time and then it vanishes away, two of the main things that I am intended, that my life should be intended to do is to love God with all my heart and to love people like God loves people. Well, you know what happens then? We, 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 we don't get so caught up in living for the future. Some would say that this, this whole idea of what James is, is trying to convey here is the true test of dependence. And actually, if you take the test, it will tell you whether you're depending on yourself or whether you're depending on God. A true test of dependence. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with understanding end times, but, but make sure you get make sure you get this. I want us all to understand that God has not called us to plan out our lives. Every tick, every tap, God, this is what I'm going to do. This is where I'm going to go. This is who I'm going to be. So I want to say there's, there's three mistakes that I think we won't get through all three of them. But I want to say there's three mistakes that I think James lays out that we can look at that verse number 17 can kind of bring us into focus that would actually point to us and say, man, there's some things about these verses that make us sin. Now, what, what, why is verse 17 so important? Well, and we'll hit this a little bit more along the way, but I think it, it stands for introductory material for you to understand the verse 17 it has to do not with sins of commission, but sins of omission. It, it doesn't have to do with murder and fornication and adultery. It, it doesn't have anything to do with all of those things that we can see in terms of, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's not, it's, it, it but... I do think, I do think that if you're not careful, that it can absolutely lead down a road to fornication, to adultery, to absolutely living our lives in some of the grossest sin we ever, we ever thought imaginable. So you're telling me that you think part of the, here, here's what I'm trying to convey, the gateway from getting to a place to where it's not just sins of omission, but then turns into sins of commission. I think the gateway is here in verse number in, in these verses that would tell us that I finally figured out how to do it without God. Like I don't need God. I think there's three mistakes that James lays out here. One is planning without God. Planning without God. Verse 13, he says, Go to now. Ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Now, don't you, don't you, don't you see what happens? He, 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 he makes some plans. He, he, he goes when and where and how long and what and why. So he, he says when, uh, today or tomorrow, where, such and such a city, how long we're going to continue there a year, what are we going to do? We're going to buy and sell. Why are we going to buy and sell? To get gain. We're going to go buy and sell to get gain. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure you understand. There's nothing wrong with wise planning. 
There ain't nothing wrong with being a planner. There's nothing wrong with being a wise planner. There's nothing wrong with making a profit. There's nothing wrong with going into such and such a city. There's nothing wrong with having all of your bases covered. But here's the thing. Not one time in their plans was God ever mentioned. Now think about it. The gateway to get into a place to where God is saying to him that knoweth the good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. God is, God is using this, these verses in this illustration right here to let us know that you can absolutely come to the place in your life to where you can be sitting on a church pew week in, week out. Involved, we'll just go ahead and lay it all out there. Involved in discipleship, involved in other ministries of the church, doing everything you know, and, and guess what? You start doing, you, you get on your feet so well that you forget that God is in the planning process. Well, I'm going to plan without God. I want to do everything that I want to do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, th- th- here it is. This man knew what he wanted to do. He knew how he wanted to get there. But guess what he didn't do? Anybody know? He didn't check with God to see if that was even the destination he needed to take. He knew what he wanted to do. He knew how much money he wanted to make. He knew where he wanted to make his money. And and the whole time, not one time, according to James, not one time did he ask God, is this your will for my life? And I wonder how many people, how many people you probably know that did a whole lot of good things, just not many God things. Did a whole lot of good things, and, and, and it seemed like a great idea at the time. It seemed like, man, this is, gonna, this is, how about this? This is my only option. You ever been there before? You ever been like, well, I don't have any other options. This, this has got to be God's plan because I don't have any other option. I don't, I don't have anything else on the table. I've got to do this, and this, 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 this God, this has got to be your plan. And here's what we do. We expect God, all right, God. So, you know, we turn into real good lawyers when it comes to God. God, you know this is my only way out. You know this is my only plan. So here's, what's gonna, here's what I'm going to do, God. God, I'm going to do this, and I hope that you're okay with it. God, I hope that you're okay with me doing this. Because, Lord, this is, this is the only way I see. And you know what? It is the only way you see. And then the whole time God's saying, man, I don't know if you remember this, but my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. It's hard to trust the Lord. I know it. It's hard to trust the Lord with with stuff like this, with stuff like your future. But I want you to understand, you are going to be, you are going to be in the hand of God if we let God We are going to be in the hands of God if we let God direct our plans instead of us directing God's hand. Planning without God is pure presumption. Planning without God is is straight up presumption. Like you are you, you like we presume that we know what God wants. Well, God, I you know. I I'm thinking this is what you want, this is what it's gotta be, and hey, guess what, God? Believe it or not, you you know, I'm gonna do it and you're gonna have to deal with it. I wonder how many of our I wonder how many of of our I wonder how many of our sowings have been in direct correlation with our reaping, excuse me, our, our, our reaping, we're in direct correlations with sowing out of the plan of God. Like, like you, you ever think, you ever, you ever went on a, you, you ever like legit knew that you was reaping what you, anybody in here, y'all ever like legit know you're reaping what you're sowing? Anybody? I mean, it's, it's, but sometimes you look in the mirror and you say, I know what this is. And, and, and you can't do anything about it, but Lord, you, you already told me, I, you know, you're going to reap, you, you're going to, you know, as Brother Mark would say, you're going to reap what you sow. Or 
you're going to reap what you sow. <laughs> like there's a really good side to this whole sowing thing and there's a really bad side to this whole sowing thing. But, but, but have you ever sat right in the middle of your, of your reaping and looked around and you say, dang, you know what this is? This is all my inventions and all my plans and all of the things that I said I wanted to do and all of the life that I wanted to build and all of the, the things that I thought about life. I just, I, you know, I decided I wanted to do this and now I'm looking around I'm like, man, this is terrible. When the whole time, you'd have been better off. You'd have been better off having less fun, less money. All of the things that you went after. And actually being in the will of God. It's a hard, it's a hard lesson to learn. Nothing's wrong with what this man did. Get, make sure you understand it. Nothing is wrong with with what he did. It's what he didn't do. That was what was so wrong. And, and that's what we got to make sure here at, at Greater Hope Baptist Church is a New Testament church. We understand there is nothing wrong with what this man did and what, how about this, there's nothing wrong with planning to do things in this church. There's nothing wrong with planning here. But here it is. It's what the man didn't do, and then we got to be careful that we don't get accused of that same thing, and not what we didn't do. We didn't plan according to the will of God. We didn't let, maybe there's some things that we, we, we could say, we didn't let God lead us. It's what he forgot to do. It's what the man forgot to do. It's not what he did, it's what he didn't do. Psalm 39 and verse number 4, Lord, make me, to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Verse 5, he says, Behold, thou hast made me, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether. Vanity, Selah. He said you, that my days are literally a handbreadth of, this is how wide that my days are. And he says my age is absolutely, it's nothing before thee. And, 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 and he says every man at his best state is altogether vanity. God, 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 it's, uh, the psalmist is, is asking is asking the Lord to help him understand his end, to, to help him measure his days, to help him understand how frail he is and how frail, how about this, how fragile life really is. It's all right to have dreams. It's all right to have goals. It's all right to have plans. It's all right to have a direction. But we got to make sure of it. God is in on the goals, that God is in on the plans, that God is in on the dream, that God is in on the direction. Because if he's not, then what is it? It's all in vain. Why? Because man at his best state is altogether vanity. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at this casket today and I'm thinking in my mind, that, that God, how true it is that I need you to teach me to number my days. How, how true it is, it, it, Tony Shirley, I, I'll never forget, I was sitting in Bible college years ago, Tony Shirley, a, a preacher from North Carolina, he came in and he said, son, I, you know, he's talking to the whole group of people in, in this Bible college class and he, he is talking to dads at this moment. He said, dads, you got 18 summers to mold your kids. You got 18 summers to live life to the fullest with your kids. If you're lucky, you have more. If you're lucky, they stay at home and go to college. And but but you know, we'll just say for 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 the sake of what it is, you got 18 summers, 18 summers, and it's over with. I remember I couldn't have swallowed a French fry on a bed at that point in time. I went home and I told Jordan, I'm like, do you realize that we only have 18 summers? <laughs> we both sat on the couch for like 30 minutes that night, like holding each other, like. 
oh my goodness, this is, at the time we got these three, uh, three of the, 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 at this point, the sweetest, most precious little girls now, you know, I don't know what they are. Sarah Joe's turned into a lawyer. She pleads her case with, with every turn. She only, she only got to is what's so bad. Like, I'm, I'm nine times out of ten, I'm on her side. And she comes in pleading her case. And I'm like, what? what, what I, yeah. Like, I, I swear, the kid, if, if she doesn't make something with her life spectacular and do something, I, I'll just be blown away. It'd be a waste. Right? R- Ruthie, she don't know what day it is nine times out of ten. Claire's just glad to be alive. Claire's glad that, you know, that I hadn't killed her. The boys, they're, they're still, we're still trying to figure them animals out. I woke up this morning, 3.30. I hear Ridge, like, tussling around. I hear a thud. And, I mean, it's crazy because, I, you know, I usually sleep like a rock. I mean, I jump up out of bed and I run in there. He starts crying a little bit. I finally get a hold of him. I'm holding him on my on my shoulder, and I'm trying to console him, and I'm like, man, are you okay? And he's like, no, my mouth hurts, and I flip the light on, and there's blood running all down my arm. We knocked, almost knocked another tooth out. It, 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 but you know what? Only got 18 summers. And being able to keep the blood from running out of his mouth. 18 of them things, man. And I remember, I'll never forget, Tony Shirley, when he said that, it changed my perception of how I raised my kids. Now, why, why is that? Well, I think it taught me to number my days with my kids. I think it taught me to start thinking in terms of quit hating everything in life that I got to go to that's dumb. Don't tell nobody, but... This whole gymnastics thing is is twice over the most most heinous and unusual punishment that you could send a man through. You go and sit all day and you watch your kid for three and a half minutes. And you watch everybody else's. All day. Don't give awards out till the evening time. All day. Just watching a bunch of sweaty girls running around doing all kinds of stuff and, and just all day. And you don't even care. Like you don't even care what them other girls are doing. Or you're just there for your kid. But you can't never tell when she's going to go. So you can't just show up and watch her and leave. Because nine times out of ten, she ends up getting some kind of something. But, you know, I, I have my wife back there that nudges me on the way in. She says, 18 summers. That's all you got, man. I was mad last night, 3.30 in the morning. Anybody else had trouble sleeping with that moon? Nobody, nobody, y'all. Huh? Yeah, yeah. That, that moon has just wrecked my world in terms of sleep. Last night, I slept like a baby. And I thought to myself, I haven't moved since I closed my eyes at 11 o'clock. Now, I lay there for another hour or two, like, dang, I can't go back to sleep. Got all this stuff on my mind. I knew I had the day coming up. And then I go back, man, I got 18 summers. 18 summers to mold my, what is that doing? Well, it's teaching me to number my days. It's teaching me to understand that my days, friend, my days are numbered anyway. Like, if I make it to 75, that's a good deal, right? 75 is a good number. If I make it to 75, hey, praise the Lord. If I make it that long, praise the Lord. But it's easy, it's easy for us as Americans to forget that God should be involved in our lifelong planning. How about the careers that we pick? about the careers that we pick? You know, or is, is those things, are those things, is God in those things? Every day, do we plan for God to be in the midst of our, in, in, in a purpose-filled, everyday way? Do we plan for God to get in the middle of that? Truthfully, 
truthfully, what it all boils down to, what it all boils down to is this. It all boils down to, without saying it, I don't believe in God. It's practical atheism. It's practical atheism. Well, I'm not an atheist. I do believe in God. But here it is. It's a very sad deal to find somebody that say, I believe that he exists. I believe that he is the creator. I believe that he is my savior. And then, get this. You ready for this? Live like he doesn't exist. It's sad when you hear somebody say, I don't believe there is a God. I don't believe in God. I don't believe there is a God. But here it is. It's a worse statement for you and me to live like you don't believe, especially to the world. It's a worse statement to those around us in the lost world to plan without God and live a life of presumption. Well, what do I do? What do you think you should do? I'd start by including God in every decision. I'd start by including God in every decision. Verse 15, he says, For that ought, for, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will. If the Lord will, here it is, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord will, we shall live. And do this or that. You can, you can almost say this. God, what do you want me to do? God, to what direction do you want me to go? How do you want me to live? Preface all of your planning with if the Lord wills. Me, me, and, me and Jordan are, you know, unfortunately in the process of trying to sell our house in this ridiculously asinine market that we're in and hoping that the Lord really blesses that. We're planning on moving and you know, every step I'm taking, I mean literally like for all the way down from pressure washing the porch yesterday, I am thinking in my mind, all right, Lord, no joke, because I'm scared to death to do something about the Lord's touch on it. Lord, if this is your will, man, I, you know, I want you to, I want this to go smooth. I want you to be, I want to be able to sell this place and, and it be, you know, us be able to make some money off of it and do what we want to do over there. If that's your will, Lord, if that's what you're, at, if that's what you want me to do. And how many, you ever, you ever looked back in your life and seen the doors that you kicked open that God didn't open? Like the things, the areas in your life that you walked in. That God had no hand that God had no hand in, but you look back on those things and you wanted it so bad you didn't care what God wanted. I've been there. Anybody ever had buyer's remorse? I mean, you bought you you bought something and you, you the whole time you're thinking about buying it. And, and you're, you don't have the money to buy it. Somebody else is, you're going to use somebody else's money to buy it. And, and you're thinking, man, I, I mean, I'm a stoker right here. I really need this. And then about the time it comes to sign the papers, you, you're, you're sitting there and you're like, Lord, I... You, you know what happened? You've seen the payment. <laughs> You've seen the payment every month. You're like, I, maybe, I, maybe this ain't the Lord's will. But, but then you look back out there and you're like, oh, well, this has got to be the Lord's will. You ever done that before? I mean, just straight up, like, you wanted to do something so bad that you just, you just decided, God, I'm going to do this, and I hope you're not mad about it. One guy said it like this. Stop praying, God bless what I'm doing. Stop praying that. Instead, pray, God help me to do what you're blessing. God, 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 I'm quit praying, God, I want you to bless what I'm doing, 
Instead, God help me to do what you're going to bless. If you're going to plan, that's fine. If you're going to plan and you're going to do things, that's, that's great. Just make sure you don't do it without God. Make sure that you don't do it without God. Make sure that you do it with God's blessing on it. I think we can all be way more conscientious of our decision making in terms of what we do in our lives is how it affects the glory of God most importantly. How this is going to pan out to the judgment seat of Christ. Is what I'm doing in my plan going to, is it, is it going to help? Is it going to bring God glory at the judgment seat of Christ? Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to open your word for a little while. God, I pray that, uh, Lord, as, as we walk through this whole idea of understanding what, what the real particulars is here in, in verse number 17, and understanding that we can get to a place, Lord, to where everything that we're doing is, is led us to a place of sin. And what, what led us there is completely forsaken who you are in terms of our, of our life's goals, of the things that we want to commit to. Lord, I, I, I'm a firm believer that those that do not plan to bring God glory in their life are going to plan very selfishly with everything that they do. God, help us not to be a church that plans like that. Help us not be a church that lives our life like that. Lord, I love you. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for everything you've done today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, two quick things I want us to pray about. And then we'll, 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 uh, we'll check out of this joint. Two quick things I want us to pray about. Number one, I want us to pray for our discipleship ministry and where we are in that whole process and uh, the, the people that's in it. Um, I, I have, um, you know, if, if, you know, if you're not careful in, the, in discipleship, it can become extremely routine if you don't make the faith aspect a priority in it and understanding that everything we do must be done in faith, then I, I want us to, I want us, that's what I want to pray about. And I want us to ask the Lord, uh, Sean, I want you to pray for us. And I want, you, I want you to just ask the Lord, you know, so I want us to understand that discipleship is not, is not something that we just do in terms of knowledge. It's something that we're trusting the Lord to perform in our lives. And it has to be by faith. Everything, every aspect of it has to be by faith. So, uh, let's, let's, if you would, just, just lead us there and, uh, and pray for discipleship ministry.
to pray about and we need to call on the Lord about. Why? Because, man, we got to keep it on the forefront of our minds, for one. And then, two, we need to all, we, this is a corporate deal. We need to gather together as brothers and sisters. And the only way we're ever going to get to that point to where the ministry of reconciliation matters is if we're doing it in faith, just like, just like discipleship ministry. If you're not doing it in faith, if it's just something you're doing, if it's, it doesn't mean anything, hey, guess what? It doesn't mean anything. It's not really going to work in the end. So I want us to pray. Justin, I'd like for you to pray for that if you would, brother.